berries in here every day. I don't know what you're all doing. <laughs> well, do you ever have a fruit in it? I've got a sense of deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, I'm going to go over to Okay. So you just come over a little bit? Sure. Does this mean you're a candidate, Mr. President? In the eyes of the law. Pardon? In the eyes of the law. Now by your honor. Preserve what Paul called wiggle room. <laughs> Have you made up your mind? Thank you, Mr. President. This is the first pen that I've used that signed six words. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> when do you think you will formally announce, Mr. President? When do you think you'll formally announce whether you're running or not? Whether I'm going to or not? Well, uh, I haven't set that date, but I know that possibly the first few years. We can assume otherwise. What? We can assume you're a candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again. Hello again. <laughs> Treasure replaced uh, Dave Buchanan. Uh, 
Kay uh, is a new girl on the block. Uh, she, uh, this will be her first savings bond campaign, and uh, she tells me that uh, she's resolved that she's going to make it a great one. So, Roger, watch out. I think that's great. Marks <laughs> later at luncheon. Uh, we'll probably be paying somewhere around nine and a quarter, uh, starting November 1st. And nine and a quarter compares very favorably with most uh, MMDAs or any other type of uh, bank account. Of course, it has to be held for five years, but even a five-year CD uh, is somewhere in that neighborhood. So uh, it's uh, uh, really a competitive product at, at this point. For this year, but we're, we're going to come after you, John. Good. I think you guys do a great job down there. Man. by taxing or cutting spending? We cure deficits by cutting spending. That's right. And if you find out uh, after you get recovery that you did something in which the percentage of revenue taken by the government is too small a percentage for a lean and efficient government, well then you adjust. But until you know that, uh, we stay the course. Just dig down there and grab some <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, I want to thank all of you. This, I know I've only got a, a minute or two here. I'm still trying to find that person who puts that paper in front of me every night and tells me what I'm going to do the next day. <laughs> they don't allow travel time <laughs> between places. But uh, I do want to thank all of you. I think this is a great and a traditional example of the private sector, working with government, perform a very necessary task and it wouldn't be performed successfully without your, your help. And I want to thank Roger and thank Jim for what you were, have done and are doing. And uh, all of you here, and uh, they told me that I, I was just supposed to come in here and try to express my thanks. And, get out because they got something else for them to do. <laughs> how, how about a little support for the product? Uh, the, the savings bond with our new rate. Incidentally, uh, we think the rate will probably be nine and a quarter or, or around that starting November 1st. So we think we got a very competitive instrument uh, with other things. Sales last year uh, under Jim did very well, uh, about four billion in sales last year, and Roger's promised that he's going to up it this year, and uh, if we get your backing, Mr. President, uh, that's all we need. Well, you had my backing. Uh, we get the team here to do the job, that's for sure. And uh, all I can tell you is that the, the team at this end that usually gathers around this table is going to do everything it can to make sure that uh, you're selling a bond based on a solid structure. Well, that's, that's Last year you bought the first product and uh, we merchandise that all across the country over and over. And uh, so uh, maybe even this year you can increase it. You had to pull over a bear in a way out of that, that secret trust. <laughs> that, uh, where I don't even know what I've got in it. But uh, if, if it's merchandising, it can help, at least I can certainly do some tokenism. It's, pay, it's payroll deduction and you never feel it. which has your message, which is great. And we appreciate your support. Well, you realize, of course, that the dichotomy here, uh, the, the job that I'm in, really trying to put uh, this whole thing out of business on <laughs> the day when we don't have to sell bonds. <laughs> but I'm sure you wouldn't quarrel with that either. Well, that's right. the final report for 1983, succinctly stated. It's been a pleasure. Well, God bless you all. Thank you again for what you're doing. And I'll, uh, 
take up the dominant uh, providing you that sales gift. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. guests, and I can properly use that term for today, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are honoring a giant in the field of American intelligence. Richard Helms, one of America's highest decorations. He will receive the National Security Medal. This National Security Medal was established by executive order of President Truman in 1953. I was only a child at the time. <laughs> it recognizes persons who have performed exceptionally meritorious service in a position of high responsibility and who have made an outstanding contribution to the national intelligence effort. Presenting this award to you, Dick, is fully appropriate and long overdue. Your career has exemplified the key standards of the intelligence officer's difficult mission, discipline, dedication, discretion, and honesty. You are one of those rare men who continues to seek ways to help your country at all stages in your life, whether it's the director of CIA, ambassador to Iran, member of the Scowcroft Commission, or a distinguished private citizen. It's a pleasure to be able to present you with this award in recognition of what you've done and what you continue to do. Major Drennan, would you read the citation? Richard Helms's distinguished career in intelligence and extraordinary service to this great nation spanned four decades and three wars. From the 1940s, when he served as a naval officer attached to the Office of Strategic Services, through his exceptional tenure as director of the Central Intelligence Agency, which ended in 1973, Richard Helms exemplified the best in our intelligence services. He served in the Central Intelligence Group, which preceded the formation of CIA, and joined the agency at its inception in 1947 as a specialist in Eastern European affairs. His subsequent career in the agency was typified by brilliance, exceptional motivation, and keen administrative ability. From January 1953 until January 1962, he served as Chief of Operations for the Office of Special Operations. From February 1962, he became Deputy Director for Plans and in April 1965 was made Deputy Director of Central Intelligence. He was appointed Director in June 1966 where he served until his 60th birthday in February 1973. Richard Helms' notable concern for his colleagues and his dedication to building a professional service devoted to the security of our nation are reflected in his development of an agency-wide career system, the training of agency personnel in specialized fields, and the establishment of the existing agency administrative system. Throughout his long career, he consistently displayed an extraordinary and comprehensive ability to organize and supervise clandestine services operations, possessed a unique ability to deal promptly and efficiently with a vast flow of detail, and was widely respected for the quality of his professional judgment. During his term as director, he enhanced public understanding of and respect for the importance of the role of intelligence in the conduct of our foreign relations. He enjoyed the highest respect and admiration of his colleagues and other senior government officials who benefited from the quality of his service to the United States. Richard Helms was recently awarded the William J. Donovan Medal and was previously presented with a Distinguished Intelligence Medal, CIA's highest award. To these and many other recognitions is now added the award of our country's highest medal in the national security field, the National Security Medal.
Thank you, Mr. President, for the honor you have done me. On this, for me, happy occasion, I am only sad that Scoop Jackson could not be here with us. He was a longtime friend and ardent supporter of American intelligence. It is not difficult to divine why this distinction means much to me. Including my service in OSS, I spent 30 years in intelligence work. This included 25 years helping to establish and build the Central Intelligence Agency. Much of this time was in work with Frank Wisner, John Bross, and many others, developing ways and means of, for, for a clandestine service later to become known as operations. During this period, we felt ourselves to be pioneers, which in one sense we were. But later research made it clear that irregular activities were well known to and practiced by our forefathers. At Monticello recently, I made a talk to a group of distinguished Virginians about the presidency and American intelligence. I introduced my remarks by quoting from a letter which Thomas Jefferson, when he was Secretary of State, wrote to James Madison on May the 27th, 1793. I quote from this letter. We want an intelligent and prudent native who will go to reside in New Orleans as a secret correspondent for $1,000 a year. <laughs> he might do a little business merely to cover his real office. Do point out such a one. Virginia ought to offer ought to offer more loungers equal to this and ready for it than any other state. <laughs> As for a different kind of special activity, one can cite another example from Jefferson, this time during his presidency. He received intelligence from France suggesting that Napoleon would be willing to coerce Spain into yielding the Floridas to the United States for $7 million, with Napoleon pocketing most of the money. Jefferson sought, and in secret session the Congress appropriated, an even greater secret discretionary fund, $2 million, to start negotiations, from which Napoleon later backed out. Intelligence has always been peculiarly a presidential responsibility. Not only does the Director of Central Intelligence report directly to you, Mr. President, but the protection of the agency, indeed of the entire intelligence community, rests in the hands of the President. It must count on support as well from both sides of the aisle in Congress. Intelligence has no political constituency. It is therefore most reassuring to note, Mr. President, that you have been fully supportive of Director Casey and that you are providing him the people and the money to enable the agency to perform the multitude of tasks which a complex, interdependent world foists upon it. The country will be well served by a strong intelligence organization dedicated to the proposition that it constitutes our first line of defense. May I also thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity to work on the Commission on Strategic Forces. As you well know, a commission can readily become a loose cannon on the deck of the ship of state. In this case, however, it was bipartisan in character and, and this behavior was responsible to a marked degree. It demonstrated the sophisticated concentration on the complexities of an arcane subject in the interest of the public welfare, can assist the President in the difficult task of developing national policy. Your graciousness and flexibility, Mr. President, in accommodating your views with the concerns of Congress and the work of the Commission have led to an American position on the START negotiations, which has achieved wider domestic and international support. This has been a shift without undermining your dedication to peace through strength a conviction with which some may disagree, but which appeals to many as the only safe path yet devised. Again, thank you, Mr. President, 
And thank you, Mr. Vice President, for your presence here today.